After the fall of the Soviet Union under German boots, the Central Siberian Republic was established. But soon, despite having been the region where Bukharin had heavily invested into industry under the Siberian plan, the state's authority withered away. And that's when our Black Army was created. Together, Soviet defectors, peasants and simple civilians all fought against the Republic and we could take control over the area around the city of Kansk. The Siberian anarchist Soviet was quickly proclaimed with the Black Army in the helm, turning our small state into one of militarized anarchism, where every man and woman is truly free and our only legislative body is the General Assembly, where collective decisions are made for the benefit of all the free people. And we are all protected from our authoritarian and bourgeoisie neighbors by the Black Army. But they aren't perfect. Our communes, those who form the General Assembly and our army must be improved, especially if we want to spread our freedom to our neighbors. So to start the improvements, the General Assembly was convened to discuss our issues. Then shortly after, the Security Council was also convened. It is it who lead every militia in the Black Army. And of course, in true anarchist fashion, the commanders in it have been elected by the soldiers themselves. Both the meetings culminated in the Third Congress of Kansk, where plenty of varying issues were discussed who are important for the foundations of our lawless territories. But that wasn't all, the progress we had already done was also shown during the Congress. Like all the projects across our communes who have made us one of the richest of our neighbors. And on the army front, new elected officers were presented and a security report to help us defend our communes was published. With the Congress now over, we can start to implement all things that we have discussed. The first being a plan to rebuild much of our lands. And to help with this, our first major reform to mobilize our free territories was passed. A significant amount of these efforts will be put into using the legacy of the Siberian plan to our advantage. Our neighbors seem to be utilizing it much better than we are, so it's important that we put in this effort. But to properly allocate our resources and lead the way to a land reform, we started gathering data about what territories are best suited for development. And as I said, it paved the way to a land reform which redrew our communal borders into more fair and equal boundaries. Looking away from our economy to the military, there are several things to fix. The fact that every officer is elected has created an issue that the officers might be completely ineffective. So despite it being a bit un-anarchistic, several officers were dismissed from their post and replaced. But to truly have great officers, we can't simply replace the unexperienced ones. We must help them to learn. And fortunately, we do have some of the most skilled generals in Siberia that will help create a military doctrine and teach the younglings. Yet, a perfect doctrine and skilled generals won't help if we run out of weapons. So to both prepare a stockpile for reinforcements and for army expansion, we will increase communication between the gun factories local suppliers and the army. The last issue that was discussed is that of shortage of qualified personnel. The Black Army did propose that we use their training infrastructure to solve this. But since we must be wary about giving the army too much power, we decided to opt for a mentor program instead where students will learn from our professionals. And as we are on the subject of education, we also assisted our communes in the construction of new schools. We've now completed all our planned reforms and with summer arriving the weather is turning into one of warfare. Soon the first few statelets will clash for control over central Siberia and we must be the most ready of all if we want to succeed in taking over the region and defend our freedom. This means balancing our supplies and the civilian chaos which will be generated. Before we had the time to prepare our army, war had already ignited. Novosibirsk and Tomsk, the two strongest powers in the region, had attacked each other. Soon the Principality of Kemerov joined in the fight against Novosibirsk. So with all the strongest warlords fighting each other, we see a chance to spread freedom. Our black army is stronger than the one of the Krasnoyarsk military dictatorship, so we didn't think much before attacking them. Not only is this an opportunity to free more people, but the amount of volunteers joining the black army shot up so we can finally fully fill our divisions. 
Our attack started in the south, where no enemy divisions were defending, which allowed us to free our first city, Abakan. But the front didn't stay empty for long, because one of the divisions had arrived to kick us back. Still, they were no match for our army in general, since we could encircle it and capture or kill those who didn't surrender. With the south now occupied, we turned our focus to the north and their capital. We started by capturing the countryside around the city where they once again didn't have any defenses. Then a long battle commenced where we slowly but surely entered the city until it was completely captured and we had taken control control over its important railway junction. During this more than 40 day war we had begun decentralizing our economy to make it more effective and anarchistic, which meant letting each commune have their own industrial administration and constructing roads to incentivize commerce between them. This decentralization not only led to our people cooperating more, but power was taken away from the black army which also made us more anarchistic. To prepare for further conflicts we will begin focusing on our economy so that we can supply our forces. And this has become incredibly important because rumors are going around that one of our neighbors is preparing an attack. And since Novosibirsk is defeated this is highly likely. Unfortunately we are unsure if it's Tomsk or Kemerov who will attack so we must spread out our forces making us weaker. But to fill the gap we've started training two more militias. After 15 days of waiting, the Kemerov declared war but no offensives were launched. About two days later, Tomsk attacked Kemerov for stealing Novosibirsk. So they are now technically our ally and we can move away our troops from their border and focus them on the principality. As we did, Kemerov's offensive started and while they won every battle we could attack from the flanks with our superior numbers and stop them. Soon we launched our own offensive and it was once again an encirclement initiative. It was successful but the battle to crush the motorized division was fierce. They almost even broke out of the pocket. Still, after weeks we managed to finally destroy it. During this a lot had happened with our communes. Krasnoyarsk had been integrated and allowed to join the General Assembly with its socialists and anarchists at the helm. Many of their civilians also signed up to join the Black Army so we will be able to expand it in preparation for more wars. Returning to the war we have the chance to capture Kemerov and Novokuznesk to already end the war. And we decided to take this free opportunity despite the fact that it will lead to us fighting against the stronger Tomsk alone. As expected Kemerov surrendered and we got all of Novosibirsk as well. To prepare for the coming war with Tomsk we started to train 6 new infantry division and then turn to our economy. Here we had already helped our communes with agriculture to keep our army and population fed. We had also started reopening mines in order to stimulate the high demands for mineral resources. But now we focused on railways, mainly the Trans-Siberian Railway, who we started repairing allowing our communes to be more interconnected and trade their resources. Before any further investments could be made, Tomsk declared war. Fortunately all our core territories are protected, but Novosibirsk and Kemerov will be undefended until our six divisions are deployed. But instead of idly waiting for them to deploy, we decided to stage an offensive where we do have troops to maybe shorten the front. Since their army isn't big enough to cover the whole front, we could use the gaps to march around those forces on the front and attack them from multiple directions. This allowed us to enter Bakta and then capture the rather large city of Lesosibirsk. In the west they had entered Novosibirsk but Kemerov was still under our control. So despite our six divisions not being fully trained we deployed them in the city with the capital of Tomsk only a hundred kilometers north. And with it open we could capture it for free and simply continue north to the city their government had fled to. The march was a long one during which we encircled one of their units, lost Tomsk then recaptured it. But in the end we reached the city and capitulated Tomsk far quicker than we had anticipated. We stand now as the only contender in central Siberia, almost at least. The People's Revolutionary Council and Oyurotia have tried to stand as still as possible to not get seen. But we haven't forgotten about their population, they too must get freed. 
Fortunately, their armies were either too few or untrained to resist our battle-hardened black army, so it didn't take long for us to enter their capitals and take over all of central Siberia. What comes now is rebuilding and integration. The foundations for our economy have already been laid, so we are ready to spread anarchism to our conquered territories and allow their communes to join the General Assembly. Which means that passing motions will be much harder and concessions will be needed. Now, Finally, we proclaim the Siberian Free Territory after a unanimous vote in the General Assembly. And so, the long road to make our future brighter and reduce instability due to our new population not knowing anything about anarchy begins. It all starts with the militarization of our society being reversed and our production being diverted to civilian industry. It did lower instability in Kansk and the surrounding area, but this won't help our new communes to learn about anarchism. So we must immediately begin implementing regional courts in these communes and let their people organize themselves. While the army believes we shouldn't give them too much power due to the fact that they still might not support anarchism, we've decided to put our full trust in its process. However, it won't hurt to still support these communes by enabling communications with our fully anarchistic lands, and revert their education to foster our youths into anarchism. And by also providing enough food and water, something that wasn't before, the people will turn to our side. As well as because poverty is decreasing and economic wealth is growing rapidly. So with the communes now truly integrated, we can once again hold a congress in Kansk. And the last one too, because we plan to move it to Novosibirsk. While preparing for industrial, army and foreign policies was the main goal, three other issues were discussed. The first being that our large cities have had a hard time to reorganize into proper anarchistic communes, unlike our villages. To fix this, direct action was taken to help them out in the transition to autonomous communal governments with the people in control. And to help them, a resolution of promoting direct democracy was passed after several concessions. The second issue is about the church. Due to the previous instability in Siberia, it grew incredibly powerful as people turned to it for stability. While banning it is going too far, we will still educate our people in secularism, making the church far weaker. And the last issue is that of the image of anarchism. Being surrounded by the West Siberian Republic and the Far Eastern Soviet Socialist Republic, both of whom seek to unite Russia, we will inevitably be forced to fight them. And if we win, we will spread anarchism anarchism to this new land, something which will be tricky. To aid in it, we will brand anarchism as the cure for Russia. As statism failed, anarchism has succeeded. With the Congress finally having reached its end, the voting on if we should move our capital to Novosibirsk has begun. And every commune except that of Kansk voted yes. So, with a new capital and all the issues settled, we can begin implementing the economic, army and foreign policies beginning with developing our free territories. And this started by aiding our urban region with their economy, rebuilding their infrastructure, reorganizing their industry and reaping the harvest of the Siberian plan which industrialized our cities. Then we looked to our peasant communes and supported them by facilitating mechanization and ensuring interconnection between all communes. Some months later we had also ensured the right to everyone's well-being, stricken a deal with some communists to ensure more worker representation in the General Assembly and focused a lot of time on education and research. And finally, the last of our economic plans is to massively decentralize it. To control the economy has never worked, just ask those who lived under Bukharin. And so, with our economy done, we can start to prepare for the inevitable war with the authoritarian Bolsheviks in our east. It took about one and a half years, during which we standardized the black army and turned it into an army for self-defense. Because while our plan is to unite all of Russia, the black army's main job is to protect our people and our total freedom. We also started investing into tanks and managed to deploy two divisions together with a bunch of upgraded infantry militias to defend our border. In addition, we had the time to declare our foreign policy, one of protection of our freedoms. And we also turned our state into a free harbor for any immigrants who seek a better life.
As the year turned to 1969, the tensions between us and the Far Eastern Soviets boiled over and the last preparations were made for the inevitable war. This meant developing our railways, preparing our factories, raising reserves and constructing fallback lines. But before we were done, they declared war. However, no offensive was launched on their side. Instead, we ordered our tanks to attack. Victory! After more than 100,000 deaths on our side, the Bolsheviks have unconditionally surrendered and we stand in control over all of Far Eastern Siberia. The integration process has already started and all new communes have been invited to the General Assembly as usual. But conflict isn't over since tensions have risen between the Assembly and the Security Council of the Black Army, both having different ideas on true anarchism. Fortunately, most communes support the General Assembly and its view of free anarchism, but the Black Army are sure to gather support and fight back. So we must outmaneuver them before they can. With Stepanov, the leader of the army, heading east, we must too. We've already sent aid all the way to Kamchatka to secure their support, but we also started attacking the army influence in Magadan. A long time ago, a fascist warlord had controlled it, supported by the Americans. We will confiscate both of their assets in the region and give it to the population, slowly turning them to our side. We then campaigned in Yagoda's territory, promising the communes that never another tyrant would take over if the assembly wins against the Security Council. 11 out of 3 communal regions were now supporting our cause and the last nail in the coffin for the Council and Stepanov was that Valentev, the field marshal who led the liberations of all of Siberia, supported our side. So the General Assembly finally dared to assassinate Stepanov, ending his plan of turning our country into a despotic dictatorship. And now anarchism and the General Assembly stand as the victors. However, the Assembly has still much to do. After the fall of the Security Council, the army lies in ruins and it isn't at all ready to defend our freedoms. And anarchism is still under scrutiny because as the council is severely weakened, its checks and balances on the assembly are gone. Because despite the assembly being committed to anarchism, with no one fighting against its power, it could turn authoritarian in an instant. To fix this, the people have decided to start putting its own checks on the assembly, all to weaken it. After only a month, the assembly leader, Piotr Siuda, understood the people's willingness for full anarchism and granted much more independence to the communes, largely decentralizing our territory and making the assembly so weak it can't turn authoritarian. The same thing, but even more radical, happened to the Black Army. Those who were seen as traitors and allies to Stepanov were shot dead or imprisoned in a great purge. And it all ended with the Security Council being completely dissolved, replacing the Black Army with the Citizen's Army. And this reform happened just in the right time. Because Vladimir III has united all of Western Russia and is starting to prepare for an offensive into our lands. Now fortunately we too have the time to prepare. 
Currently, four tanks and 15 infantry divisions are in training, and we have also deployed our first 10 interceptor aircrafts, who are currently being produced in a joint effort by our communes. During these preparations, we started noticing our communes flourishing after the decentralization. The spirit of their population were raised, and the newly liberated communes in the East were shown the success of anarchism and taught how to replicate it to create opportunities for them. All this also strengthened our battle readiness as each commune provided the war planning with what they could. Some changed their civilian factories to construct parts for aircrafts, both interceptors and CAS, and others helped building bunkers along our front. So with our army now over 40,000 men strong and despite the monarchists having more, we are confident in our defenses and decided to launch a preemptive offensive, basically declaring war on them. The offensive was located around the fortified city of Omsk with the goal of capturing it and some surrounding lands on the east of a river. While its bunkers allowed their troops to hold their attacks back at first, a combination of our tanks and aircrafts could chase them out and we captured our first province. After capturing a second in its north, we turned to Omsk where we surprisingly could capture the city despite its defenses. We almost managed to cross the river and encircle two divisions as well, but sadly failed. Despite having lost almost double the amount of people and equipment, the capturing of Omsk is well worth it and with a huge amount of reserves we have the resources to continue. With our tanks once again we followed the river to the west until we reached Tobolsk where we turned north and united with our infantry encircling three divisions. After crushing all three our casualties are now less than that of the monarchists. And even better, we have a plan to probably double or even triple their casualties, which if successful would secure a victory in the war. And the plan is to encircle all monarchist troops in Omsk. The monarchists have surrendered for the second time in history and we stand as the only contender left in all of Russia. In a proclamation by the General Assembly, Russia was declared unified and the process to integrate and learn anarchism to all the new communes in the West has started. So while no foreign observers had predicted this outcome, anarchism has won its first major battle. Our people are now the only truly free humans on earth and our economic growth is the fourth largest in the world, something which will only grow as our new communes are becoming integrated. So thanks a lot for watching and make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss future videos. I hope to see you there.